If someone attacked your home in the middle of the night, pounding and kicking on your door, you'd probably have some questions, right? Well, a Forest Grove family was apparently kept in the dark that their suspected intruder was a cop. I'm not as secure as I used to feel. It just makes my throat just kind of close up like, oh my God. And it took a retired journalist digging around to get the complete story. It seemed like, what is going on here? Is this like a deliberate cover up of something? And some of you have been asking, can my employer actually force me to get vaccinated? What about a school or a business where I like to shop? And what's the deal with vaccine exemptions? This is something that is uh, a great controversy in Oregon because a lot of people are vaccine hesitant. Here's the story. Okay, hey, great controversy. We like great controversy here. We can talk about that. Well, Dan Haggerty, thanks for being with us. Hello, this is the story. All the ways that you want to communicate with us at the bottom of your screen, we want you to talk to us. So tell us what you're thinking, comments you might have on the content we're talking about tonight, where you think we should cover the stories we head and go do in the future, all that kind of stuff. Use the hashtag HeyDan. Now, let's get started. And I want to start tonight with a huge worth your time. Huge because this is a six-part series of columns in the Portland Tribune. The title of column number one, Doubts About Police Case, Lead Reporter on Quest for Answers. The whole series is up right now on the Portland Tribune's website. And it follows up on a story that we covered last year when an off-duty police officer allegedly and drunkenly terrorized a Forest Grove family. They had no doubt at the time that they were targeted, in their opinion, because of the Black Lives Matter flag hanging on the outside of their house. It was really scary for them, that's obvious. But what happened next has scared this family in a, in a whole different way. Here's Maggie Vespa. Well, you expect an officer like, you know, the police department, you call them, that they're going to make sure that you are safe. But I don't feel that they did that by any means. Mireya Castaneda is forever changed. Same goes for her husband, mom, and four kids, the family who proudly displayed a Black Lives Matter flag on their home to support the racial justice movement that sparked last year. Whenever I think about it, I just makes my throat just kind of close up like, oh my God. It all started last fall. The 39-year-old wife and mother of four was awakened by some commotion in the early morning hours of Halloween. As we covered at the time, the Forest Grove family of six woke up that morning to a drunken stranger punching that Black Lives Matter flag and kicking their truck, which had BLM painted on it. Castaneda said the man tried to kick in their front door and threatened to fight her husband. Here's what she told us then. I've never been so frightened, never had someone attack come at us. Eventually, the man ran away. The family called police who said they'd arrested him. Still, Castaneda's 13-year-old son was so scared, he slept with a knife. It left her determined to find out what happened. But as Castaneda told us this week, that would prove difficult. I think more than anything, it's been disappointment. There's um, some fear maybe mixed in there. In short, Forest Grove police wouldn't tell her who the alleged attacker was. They did tell her the case had been turned over to the Washington County Sheriff's Office. And for more than two days, deputies there also wouldn't tell her the suspect's name. Castaneda remembers she thought she was going crazy. I'm not as secure as I used to feel. Finally, after multiple trips to the sheriff's office and calls to the district attorney, she got her answer. The man Forest Grove police arrested was one of their own. Officer Stephen Teets, seen here in a photo from a 2019 department report and here in a mugshot charged with disorderly conduct and criminal mischief. The delay and the ID caught the attention of Jill Rykoff Smith. You know, it just seemed like what is going on here? Is this like a deliberate cover up of something? Smith is a retired journalist turned racial justice activist, experienced enough to know it's standard protocol for victims of a crime to immediately learn the name, address and employer of anyone police arrest in their case. To just be, uh, you know, shunted from one office to the next office and back to the other office and back to the other office and everyone's saying, oh, they'll have it. No, they'll have it. That was excruciating. What followed was her six part series in the Portland Tribune. It lays out the horror the family went through that night and why it took them days to learn who was responsible for the attack. 
Here are the highlights. The night of the attack, Forest Grove police responded and found Teets walking near the home, but because they say he was drunk and aggressive, they reportedly let him go home. Following protocol, the case was turned over to an outside agency, the Washington County Sheriff's Office. The deputy in charge privatized the case. That also follows protocol and happens in high profile or sensitive cases, like when the suspect is a cop. But according to Washington County Sheriff Pat Garrett, the records department should have known victims can still get info on the suspect. The agency has since conducted an internal review and the sheriff says they've implemented better training. Investigation integrity is super important, but so are serving victims and making sure that they feel supported and safe and cared for. And, and frankly, we came up short. We recognize that. I've apologized to them. Castaneda says she's appreciative. She's way less satisfied with Forest Grove police. Officer Teets is still employed, and for now, he's on administrative duties. Court records show his trial is set for this summer. Two other Forest Grove officers are on paid leave pending an outside investigation into how the department handled Teets's case. Castaneda, meanwhile, is doing her best to help her family move on and trust again. I mean, I have quite a bit of family and friends that um, are in some way or other um, part of law enforcement. This is an individual, you know, or these individuals are not good cops, but that doesn't mean that all cops hopefully will behave in that way. Part of rebuilding that trust, the family has kept that Black Lives Matter flag alongside the American flag up on their home since the attack. Maggie Vespa, KGW News. All right, let's turn to our big story now. See, last night we talked about vaccine hesitancy. Lots of people, frankly, don't want the vaccine. They don't trust it. And David emailed me and David said, hey, Dan, I watched the story on vaccine hesitancy. It almost sounds like people who do not want the vaccine are going to be pressured to get it in order to achieve herd immunity. Is that really appropriate? Yes, it is. It is appropriate if, if you ask me or if you ask the courts or many business owners or lawmakers. But you, David, you may not think so. You may be hesitant, though Dennis pointed out Hesitancy is not the same as refusal. One denotes waiting for more information to decide. The other is a final decision, not the same. Well, Dennis, thank you. David, if you're not hesitant, if you are instead refusing, allow me to prove Dennis wrong and provide you with some more information that may change your mind. Let's start with the fact that the government can make you get the vaccine if they really want to. Plain and simple, they can make you. Don't believe me? Perhaps you forgot this measles outbreak in New York in 2019 when the city declared an emergency, made vaccinations mandatory, then started fining people a thousand bucks when they refused. That can't be legal, you scream. Yes, it is, said a judge. A group of parents tried to sue at the time, and in his ruling, the judge said, a fireman need not obtain the informed consent of the owner before extinguishing a house fire. Still, you don't agree. You have rights, after all. And this is a fight that you would take all the way to the top, to the Supreme Court, just like they did in 1905, when the justices upheld mandatory vaccines by a 7-2 to vote after a smallpox outbreak in Massachusetts. The court held that in every well-ordered society charged with the duty of conserving the safety of its members, the rights of the individual in respect of his liberty may at times, under the pressure of great dangers, be subjected to such restraint, to be enforced by reasonable regulations as the safety of the general public may demand. Right now, I imagine that some vaccine refusers are feeling a bit backed into a corner, maybe looking for a way out, like, let's say, a religious exemption, perhaps, which Oregon offers as a uniquely convenient escape pod for anti-vaxxers. Law professor Laura Appleman explained it to me like this. Oregon and Idaho are the two states that have the broadest uh, religious and personal exception. And those are pretty simple to get. You just state that you are uh, opposed to these vaccines, either for uh, personal or religious reasons. And there you go. 
So the government can make you get the vaccine unless you live in Oregon where they can kind of try to make you. But to be honest, they probably won't succeed. And I doubt they're going to try to do that anyway. That would be a pretty serious move. See, in December of last year, President Biden told the whole world that COVID vaccinations in the U.S. will not be mandatory. And that's coming from the president. But you know how politicians talk. While it may never be quote unquote mandatory, there are plenty of ways to make it feel that way. For instance, the federal government could make the vaccine essential to getting a passport or they could require it for certain licenses that you need to work across state lines, like a truck driver, for instance. But again, both of those options are pretty extreme. I wouldn't expect either of those to happen, but you could see something like this happen. Brown University is requiring vaccines for all students this fall. So are a handful of other schools. I haven't heard from any of our local colleges or universities about what they plan to do or if this is an idea they're even considering, but it is a possibility. There's also the idea that your employer could fire you unless you've get, you get this vaccine. You've heard this, right? Which they can, I should mention, but it's unlikely. If they did, you could fight it. And in Oregon, you'd probably win. Now, let's say your private employer wants you to get a vaccine and you say no. Well, so they can't force you to do that. That's unconstitutional. They can probably require that you wear a mask. So let's say your company says, well, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. But if you're not vaccinated, you do. That would be OK. But it's, I think, extremely unlikely that any employer is going to require so they can't really make you get vaccinated, okay? But, but they could make you wear a mask or maybe work from home or work from a satellite office or get even more creative, like in Virginia. Lawmakers there passed a law that gives perks, special perks and advantages to healthcare workers who got vaccinated. See, it's easier for those people under this law in Virginia to collect certain medical expenses or lost wages than it would be for the people who refuse the shot. So basically, the people who got the vaccine are sitting in first class with this type of stuff, while the people who refuse the vaccine are in coach next to the bathroom and a crying kid that just went to the bathroom. And let's remember Kroger, remember what they did? They offered $100 bonuses to employees who got the vaccine. The people who don't get the vaccine don't get those bonuses. So what's the moral of the story? All these things I'm kind of intertwining together here. Well, for me, three things are true. First, in Oregon, unless lawmakers make some changes or voters make some amendments, if you really don't want the vaccine, it's gonna be pretty hard for anybody to force you to get it. Two, if you don't get the vaccine, and we don't reach herd immunity, COVID will always be with us, killing people. And three, it is statistically impossible to reach herd immunity if we don't vaccinate kids next. The trials for 12 to 15 year olds are already wrapping up. The big pharma companies, Pfizer and the, and the sort, they've already started trials on infants and young kids as young as six months old. And if you think people are hesitant about taking the vaccine now, Wait until it's time to poke their five-year-olds. You also can't help but find it interesting. I can't, anyhow. I can't help but find it interesting that so quickly the focus around vaccines in Oregon and the country will inevitably change from people begging for the shot to those hiding from it. And I'm curious to see how our community responds. Now. Let's count some vaccines. Let's talk about the people who are not hesitant, which uh, there are a lot of them. 1.2 million people in the state of Oregon have gotten at least the first dose of the vaccine. Uh, a majority of these people have actually gotten both shots, and that puts us at just about 30% of the state's population with that first shot. In Washington, there are well over 2 million, 2.32 million people have gotten the first dose of one of the vaccines. It works out to be about 31% of Washington's population. Now, still, we get a lot of questions about the vaccines. More people are becoming eligible every single day. Keep sending those questions to the story at KGW.com, and we'll keep sending them to our kind of resident vaccine expert, Pat Doris, to answer. Some more spectacular comments and questions involving the COVID vaccine. Let's dive in. Hannah says, what a joke. I spent over an hour trying to get a COVID appointment via OHSU and received countless frustrating errors, and I'm a computer-savvy young adult. I can't even imagine the frustration the elderly or those without easy access to tech feel like. And now at 10.04, all those appointment times I tried to snag are gone. Time to invest in better infrastructure, OHSU. 
Well, Hannah, thanks for the input. And uh, folks, I should tell you, I actually ended up interviewing Hannah for a story we did earlier today. And she told me that a friend later helped her find an appointment, but her experience was common. A lot of people had this challenge. And OHSU says, what do you want us to do? We have a, a computer scheduling website that's designed to have about 4,800 people on it all at one time pretty similar to what Legacy had for the convention center. And when they say they're gonna open up all these appointments at 9 a.m., like they're gonna do, by the way, tomorrow and the next day, they have thousands of people coming in and crash it. So 11,000 people were on the site this morning at 9 a.m. trying to get, uh, I think it was fifth, no, it was, uh, almost 7,000, almost 6,000 appointments, 5,700 appointments. Brain was going a little crazy there. But uh, a lot of people trying to get not that many appointments, and that's part of the problem with moving up these eligibility times and not having enough vaccine around, by the way. Uh, we're going to run into more of this. The OHA calls them roadblocks, and uh, I think we're going to have a bunch more of those. Thanks for the input, Hannah. It was nice talking to you today. Heidi has a question. Do I have to go with my 16-year-old when she gets her COVID shots? Is there a form I can sign for her to take with her? Or can she do it 100% on her own? Heidi, excellent question. We've been trying to get that out of the OHA all day today. And I actually heard from one of the other providers that, hey, guess what? There's an OHA document that says, yes, your daughter can give consent on her own. I'm looking at it right now. It's something that the OHA put together for uh, teens, and it says that uh, minors who are 15 or older are able to consent to medical and dental services without parental consent. So there you go. Just remember, 16 and 17 year olds only can get the Pfizer vaccine. That's the only one authorized for them. It's generally in the greater Tri-County area and Salem. Sorry uh, to you folks in the rural area. I know that some places do have um, those deep freeze freezers, and so it's not everybody in the rural area, but um, a lot of you teens may have to come to the Portland area to get your shots. Okay, onward. Jeff says, when I read the headline that the president intends to send 4 million COVID-19 vaccinations to Mexico and Canada, I think I was pretty shocked. The reason why 4 million is important is because that many doses would pretty much complete Oregon's vaccination campaign, and I'm not yet eligible to receive my first dose. If you think about it, those 4 million doses ought to go to us Oregonians rather than being sent abroad. Jeff, I hear you, and it's an interesting point. Uh, from what I've read, the president is thinking about sending those doses, um, the AstraZeneca doses, which are not yet approved for emergency use in the US, and they're saying it'd be something like a loan. I don't really get how that would work, but um, they're also trying to stem the flow of illegal immigration coming in from Mexico, and they say, oh, it's got nothing to do with it. Well. You might be a little skeptical like me, then we're both skeptical and agreeing on that one. So um, it, the point is that I'm trying to make is it's not like we could use that vaccine right now in the U.S. anyway. We might be able to in a few months. I'm not sure. But yep, it is something the president's doing. You're not wrong on that. Um, they're definitely talking about it. I don't know if there's been a formal agreement on that yet, but it's definitely drawing close. All right, thanks gang for the input, the comments, the questions, and all your COVID vaccine issues. Keep them coming. We love handling them. That's what's going on with the COVID vaccine today. Apparently not everyone is a fan of the Bosnian beast, like his neighbor, who's suing Nurk over some trash that got dunked over the fence. Also, anyone remember Portland without its living room? We've got to look back at Pioneer Courthouse Square through the years in the KGW vault when the story continues. Getting some good questions from everybody about the vaccine uh, content that we just talked about a moment ago. So keep those coming. Use the hashtag HeyDan. We're also on Instagram. I'm not sure if you know that. It's another kind of really good way to communicate with us. You can follow the story, the show at the story KGW, or follow me specifically at Dan.Haggerty on Instagram. Now, we've been talking about Portland's trash problem a lot recently. I mean, it's pretty obvious that there's a trash problem. Just go ahead and drive around town. And apparently, there's also a bit of a trash problem in some of our affluent suburbs, like really specifically right next to Yusuf Nurkic's Westland Mansion. His next door neighbor, Kent Sida, is suing the Blazer Star for dumping, quote, debris, including trash, tree limbs, concrete, and rocks over his fence and onto the neighboring property. Sida claims that the, this damaged the fence, and he wants Nurk to pay $8,700 to fix it. 
Now look, I'm no detective, but why don't we take a, why don't we take a look at some of the evidence here? All right, on one hand, Nurk is extremely tall. I mean, dude's like seven foot. So I guess he could probably reach over a fence, depending on how tall he is, or it is. You get my point. On the other hand, he's also hurt, always getting hurt. Am I right, Blazers fans? At the beginning of the season, it was a wrist fracture. He's sitting out tonight's game against the Clippers because of a knee inflammation. So I don't know how much yard work he's doing with all those injuries. And by the way, let's check the date on the lawsuit just to do some investigative reporting here. See when the neighbor actually claims this all happened. On or about April 23rd, 2021. Huh. Well, either this guy's time machine is messed up or it's a typo. It's probably a typo. Either way, I guess we don't actually know when this alleged trash dump occurred. I should also mention that Nurk's neighbor is no stranger to filing lawsuits. These are all of the court records that we found for him going back 34 years. Feels like a lot. I don't know. I'm not, a, again, I'm not a detective or a lawyer, but, I, I, you know, it just, it looks like it's, it's more than I filed. Let me put it that way. We'll keep our eyes on this story and we'll see what happens. Now, one of our favorite segments on this show is the KGW Vault. We dip into our archives, we take a look at some of the things KGW has covered over the years. And sometimes, when we're just kind of looking for ideas, we'll check the calendar and we'll say, hey, what happened in the years ago on this day? Well, today, April 6th, it's the 37th anniversary of Pioneer Courthouse Square opening. So here's a look back at Portland's living room in the KGW Mall. A century ago, the Portland Hotel went up where Portland's first public schoolhouse had been for 25 years. The hotel was there for six decades. Then in the 50s, Myron Frank turned the lot into a double-decker parking garage. It stood for three decades, until the city broke ground on Pioneer Courthouse Square. Since then, construction and demolition has transformed the face of this block at a dizzying pace. What had changed about once every 50 years is now changing once every three weeks. Gorgeous, nice ski area. Swing that corner promenade. Fence in the square, put up a stage, have a concert, tear it down, all in one day. Have a religious candlelighting ceremony one night, a midnight movie festival another. Lights, cameras, and bring on Jane Pauley and Brian Gumbel for the National Today Show, broadcast from Portland. Break set and make room for the biggest lottery machine ever. The square was even a recording studio for a week to give some people a chance at stardom. New York, New York, isn't everything they say? Now the quick change artists at the square are taking on their biggest project ever, building a skating rink. The crews worked all day Saturday building that stage and most of the day yesterday at 8 o'clock last night they came in with this tent it got up at 4 o'clock this morning, and it's just been non-stop activity since. One week, this crew will build a stage that supports 120 people skating on a sheet of ice that must stay frozen in a climate that seldom dips below freezing. This project calls for a huge refrigeration unit, a lot of sweat, and long hours. Crazy person's hours. I've been working a lot of hours, and I have to say I'm looking forward to January when it slows down just a little bit. January is when the people who run the square dream up their plans for next year. After this, who knows what they'll come up with. It's going to be nice when people can start hanging out at the square again. Don't you think? We're getting there. Hey, um, if you have suggestions for the vault, let me know. Use that hashtag HeyDan. In the meantime, I'm going to read a couple of your comments that you sent during today's show next when we finish this thing up. See you then. All right, not a ton of time, but I want to read this comment I got here from Annette. Annette said, hey Dan, what about people who want to wait for full FDA approval rather than emergency approval? So that's a great point. The, the vaccines right now are still only in emergency approval. They haven't gotten the full FDA approval right now. And that's one of the reasons you're not seeing a bunch of mandates. It's too early on for that. There's two reasons actually. One is the approval process. And the second is the fact that there are far more people who need the vaccine than vaccines that are available. So it's hard to mandate something or punish people for not having something that is uh, that is in a very small supply. 
considering the entire population. You saw the, the thing about Virginia that we, we pointed out. That was with healthcare workers who at this point are expected to have at least had the option to be vaccinated the entire population. So um, I hope that I, I'm rambling, but I hope that I hope I explained it. If you have any other questions, use that hashtag. Hey, Dan, there's still I, we, we're more than a year into this, and I know that we still have questions about COVID, the vaccine, the entire process. Please let us know. Use that hashtag. Hey, Dan, reach out and send us an email at the story KGW.com, and I'll send it to somebody smart like Pat Doris or something to answer it. See you tomorrow.